Hello from Who Died Today America, and welcome back to our channel. In the past few days, we have received somber news about the passing of extraordinary talents. Today's episode is dedicated to honoring their memory. Additionally, we will recap the stars whom we have recently lost. Before we begin, we kindly ask for your support. If this video or the legacies of these remarkable individuals have touched your life, please consider giving this video a thumbs up as a sign of respect and remembrance. Thank you, Charlie Collin, a founding member and bassist of the acclaimed rock band Train, tragically passed away at the age of 58. He died after a slip and fall accident in the shower while house sitting for a friend in Brussels, Belgium. His untimely death was confirmed five days later when the homeowners returned. He was pivotal in shaping Train's sound, contributing significantly to their first three albums, their self-titled debut in 1998, Drops of Jupiter in 2001, and My Private Nation. It was during this period that Train rose to fame, especially with their hit, Drops of Jupiter, Tell Me, which not only reached number five on the Billboard Hot 100, but also garnered two Grammys for Best Rock Song and Best Instrumental Arrangement Accompanying Vocalists. Born in Newport Beach, California, his musical journey began in his youth. He met Rob Hotchkiss in seventh grade and later pursued formal music education at the Berklee School of Music, focusing on jazz composition guitar. His professional music career started in Los Angeles, where Hotchkiss invited him to join a band signed to Polygram Records. After a brief stint with the group Apostles, Colin Hotchkiss and Jimmy Stafford formed what would become Train by the mid-1990s. Despite achieving significant success, Colin left the band in 2003 due to struggles, marking a tumultuous end to his time with Train. He continued to be active in the music scene, collaborating with various bands, including Painbirds, and forming the side deal in 2017. He was also involved in music direction for the Newport Beach Film Festival at the time of his passing. His influence on the music industry, marked by his distinctive bass playing and role in Train's formative years, leaves a lasting legacy. His contributions to music and his presence will be deeply missed by fans and colleagues alike. Richard Forongi, whose remarkable transformation from convicted criminal to celebrated character actor captured the imagination of both film audiences and peers alike, passed away at the age of 86 on May 7th. Known for his riveting portrayals of both lawmen and lawbreakers, Faranji's own tumultuous life lent an authenticity to his roles that few could rival. Born on August 3, 1937 in Brooklyn, Faranji's early life was marred by a cycle of crime and incarceration, culminating in an eight-year prison sentence. It was during these formidable years that he indulged in a prolific reading habit and learned typing, skills that would later greatly influence his dramatic career pivot. Inspired by an episode of Kojak, Faranji decided to turn to acting a field where his past misdeeds could inform his performances with a rare depth and realism. Forongi made his screen debut in the critically acclaimed Serpico, playing a cop killer, a role that would set the stage for a series of complex characters. Throughout his career, he collaborated with notable directors such as Sidney Lumet, Martin Brest, and Brian De Palma, bringing memorable characters to life in films like Midnight Run and Carlito's Way. Despite his rocky beginnings, Forongi's life in Hollywood was a testament to personal redemption and transformation. His journey from robbing banks to stealing scenes in major motion pictures was not only a tale of personal triumph, but also served as an inspiration to those who believed in second chances. His memoir, From the Mob to the Movies, published in 2020, offers a candid look at his life's arc from darkness to cinematic acclaim. Survived by his significant other Wendy, his four children, brothers, and 17 grandchildren, Forongi's legacy is a poignant reminder of the redemptive power of change and the impactful art that can emerge from the most unlikely beginnings. His story remains a beacon of hope and a testament to the transformative power of the human spirit.
Barbara Fuller, an accomplished American actress who graced both the silver screen and radio airwaves, passed away at the age of 102. Beginning her career in the golden age of radio and transitioning into film and television, Fuller's versatility and dedication to her craft left a lasting imprint on the entertainment industry. Born on July 31, 1921 in Nahant, Massachusetts, Fuller was thrust into the world of acting at a young age. She first showcased her talent in radio, performing in Chicago between the ages of 9 and 11. By the time she was 18, Fuller had appeared in 25 radio serials, including notable shows like One Man's Family, which won a Peabody Award and is considered the first soap opera. In 1949, Fuller signed a contract with Republic Pictures, marking the beginning of a significant phase in her acting career. She appeared in several B-movies throughout the 1950s, changing her hair color from platinum to brunette, adapting her appearance to fit various roles. Noteworthy films included The Red Menace, where she portrayed Molly O'Flaherty, and Lonely Heart Bandits. Her film career extended into the late 1960s and early 1970s with roles in How Sweet It Is and The Roommates. Fuller's television career was equally prolific, with appearances in a multitude of series from Adventures of Superman in 1953 to Daniel Boone in 1970. Her roles in Perry Mason and My Three Sons are particularly memorable, showcasing her adaptability and depth as an actress. Off-screen, Fuller's life was as vibrant as her career. She was once married to Western film star Lash LaRue, though their union was brief. Her longevity and continued engagement with acting into her later years highlighted her passion for storytelling and her commitment to entertainment. Barbara Fuller's legacy in the realms of radio, television, and film is indelible. She leaves behind a body of work that not only entertained, but also captured the essence of each era she performed in, making her a true treasure of American entertainment. Fred Roos an influential American film producer whose vision and craftsmanship left an indelible mark on Hollywood, passed away on May 18th in Beverly Hills, California, just shy of his 90th birthday. Renowned for his collaborative works with Francis Ford Coppola, Roos's career was punctuated by his remarkable talent for nurturing and realizing cinematic excellence. Born on May 22, 1934, in Santa Monica, California, Roos began his career in the entertainment industry as a casting director, where he demonstrated an uncanny ability to discover and foster talent. This skill set proved invaluable as he transitioned into film production, where he became a seminal figure behind some of the most iconic films in American cinema. Perhaps best known for producing The Godfather Part II, for which he won an Academy Award for Best Picture, Roos's collaboration with Coppola yielded other critical successes, including Apocalypse Now and Youth Without Youth. His keen eye for detail and profound understanding of narrative pacing helped usher these complex films to their classic status, influencing countless filmmakers and shifting the paradigms of storytelling within the film industry. Roos's legacy extends beyond his filmography. He was a member of the jury at the 29th Moscow International Film Festival in 2007, contributing his expertise to the global cinema community. His impact on the industry was not only through his films, but also through his mentorship of aspiring filmmakers, helping them to hone their crafts and find their own voices. As the film community remembers Fred Roos, they reflect on a career that was characterized by a passion for film and a commitment to artistic integrity. His works continue to resonate with audiences around the world, ensuring his place in the annals of cinema history as a true pioneer and visionary. Victoria Catlin, an esteemed American actress recognized for her compelling roles in both film and television, passed away at the age of 71. Born Victoria Schechter on September 23, 1952, in Moline, Illinois, Catelyn carved out a niche for herself in the world of acting with her distinctive characters and unforgettable performances. Perhaps most famously, Catelyn portrayed Blackie O'Reilly, the enigmatic Madam of One-Eyed Jacks, 
in the cult classic television series Twin Peaks. Her portrayal brought depth and intrigue to the role, captivating audiences and cementing her place in the show's storied legacy. In addition to her work on Twin Peaks, Catlin took on roles in several notable films, including Ellen Forrest in Maniac Cop, where she starred opposite Bruce Campbell, and Dr. Catherine Peake in Howling V, The Rebirth. Her role as Anastasia in Ghoulies further showcased her versatility and ability to adapt to various genres. Her career also included performances in Mutant on the Bounty, as well as appearances in the films Slow Burn and Made to Order, and on television in Amazing Stories and Adam-12. Each role demonstrated her skill at crafting unique and memorable characters. Victoria Catlin's legacy in the entertainment industry is marked by her charismatic screen presence and the diverse characters she brought to life. Her performances have left an indelible mark on fans and colleagues alike, ensuring that her contributions to cinema and television will be remembered and appreciated for years to come. Jim Otto, a revered figure in American football history and a cornerstone of the Oakland Raiders, passed away on May 19th at the age of 86. Otto's football career, marked by resilience and skill, set a standard for excellence in the professional sports world. Born and raised in Wausau, Wisconsin, Otto's football journey began under the tutelage of coach Wynn Brockmeyer and continued at the University of Miami, where he not only honed his skills as a center, but also played linebacker. Despite going undrafted by the NFL due to his size, Otto's determination led him to the Oakland Raiders of the American Football League, where he became an iconic number 00 and remained with the team through its transition into the NFL. Over his remarkable 15-season career, Otto never missed a game, showcasing his unparalleled work ethic and endurance. He was a pivotal figure in the Raiders' AFL Championship win in 1967 and their subsequent appearance in Super Bowl II. Otto's legacy includes his induction into the Pro Football Hall of Fame in 1980, his first year of eligibility, and his selection to both the AFL All-Time Team and the NFL 100th Anniversary All-Time Team. Off the field, Otto faced tremendous physical challenges, undergoing nearly 74 surgeries due to the injuries sustained during his playing years, which ultimately led to the amputation of his right leg. Yet his spirit remained unbroken, and he continued to engage with football and his community. Otto's contributions to football are monumental, but his resilience and spirit of perseverance are what truly define his legacy. His life story serves as an inspiration, demonstrating the profound impact of dedication, passion, and resilience, both on and off the field. Jim Otto leaves behind a legacy that transcends his sports achievements, embodying the true spirit of a warrior and a champion. James Gregory, beloved American stand-up comedian known for his homespun humor and charismatic storytelling, passed away from cardiac complications on May 9th, just three days after his 78th birthday. Born on May 6, 1946, in Lithonia, Georgia, Gregory didn't start his comedy career until the age of 36, but he quickly made a name for himself with his distinctive style of humor that resonated with audiences across the country. Before taking the stage, Gregory worked as a salesperson, a job that honed his ability to connect with people, a skill that would serve him well in his later career. He made his comedic debut at the Punchline Comedy Club in Atlanta, where he began as an introducer before taking the spotlight himself. His natural talent for comedy was evident from his first feature act on February 17, 1982. Gregory's comedy, characterized by its relatable and often humorous observations on everyday life, was captured in his popular album and book, It Could Be a Law I Don't Know, and his video, Grease Gravy and John Wayne's Mama. His storytelling approach, rich with Southern charm and wit, made him a favorite on the comedy circuit and a regular guest on several syndicated radio shows, including The John Boy and Billy Show, Rick and Bubba, The Bob and Tom Show, and Steve in DC. 
James Gregory's legacy in comedy is marked by his ability to turn the mundane into the extraordinary through humor. His work not only entertained, but also provided a comforting, humorous take on the complexities of life. Gregory will be remembered as a pillar of American comedy, whose stories brought laughter and joy to many, making the ordinary seem extraordinary. Lisa Lane, the trailblazing American chess player who became the U.S. women's chess champion in 1959, passed away from cancer at her home in Carmel, New York. Born in Philadelphia, Lane rose to prominence in the chess world remarkably quickly, capturing the national title just two years after she began playing competitively. Her victory and subsequent appearance on the cover of Sports Illustrated in 1961 marked her as a significant figure in promoting chess, particularly women's participation in the sport. Lane's chess career was distinguished not only by her rapid ascent to the top, but also by her role as a pioneer for women in chess, during a time when female players were far less visible. She held the U.S. Women's Chess Championship title until 1962, and again shared the honor in 1966 with Gisela Kahn Gresser. Lane competed internationally, representing the United States in the Women's World Championship Tournament. Beyond the chessboard, Lane's impact was felt in her efforts to reshape public perceptions of women in chess. Frustrated with the constant focus on her status as a champion rather than as an individual, she eventually moved away from professional chess. Her later years were spent operating a health and natural food store and subsequently a gift shop, reflecting her diverse interests and entrepreneurial spirit. Lisa Lane's legacy is not merely in her chess victories, but in her contribution to broadening the scope of how female chess players are perceived and appreciated. Her life journey underscores the challenges and changes women have navigated in competitive arenas, making her story not only one of personal achievement, but also of significant cultural impact. Breaking news of the day. News 1. Christina Applegate courageously reveals her battle with an eating disorder during her time on the hit sitcom Married with Children. In a candid conversation on the Messy podcast with Jamie Lynn Sigler, Applegate disclosed that at the peak of her eating disorder, she restricted her diet to just five almonds a day. Eating even one extra almond brought her to tears, driven by a desire for her bones to be prominently visible. Applegate's struggle began at 15 when she first appeared as Kelly Bundy, a role that pressured her to maintain a thin figure. By the time filming began for the show, her condition had escalated to the point where her job was nearly jeopardized due to concerns for her health. Her battle with the disorder spanned decades, significantly influenced by a competitive dynamic with her mother, who also struggled with body image issues. Now facing multiple sclerosis, Applegate's revelations come as part of a broader openness about her personal challenges, shedding light on the intense pressures child actors face in Hollywood and sparking discussions on mental health and body image. News 2. The death of actor Matthew Perry is currently under investigation due to a concerning level of ketamine found in his system, as reported by authorities on May 21st. The Los Angeles Police, in collaboration with the U.S. Drug Enforcement Administration and the U.S. Postal Inspection Service, are seeking to determine the origin of the ketamine that led to Perry's death. The 54-year-old was found unresponsive in his hot tub by an assistant and pronounced dead at the scene on October 28th. According to the autopsy report released in December, the primary cause of death was the high concentration of ketamine typically used for anesthesia, found in his blood. Drowning and other medical conditions were also noted as contributing factors. The coroner's investigation highlighted that Perry had been receiving ketamine infusion therapy for depression, anxiety, and pain. But the levels detected were inconsistent with his last treatment one, two weeks prior. This has raised questions about how the ketamine was administered and whether any legal repercussions will follow for those involved in providing the substance. 